So in the next big update, the food system will be split up into distinct food types, and we have mentioned seven so far. Soft plant tissue, which includes grass, seeds, fruits, nuts, meat, eggs, and nectar. But in this update, I will introduce six more, six new ones. In this video, we'll go over them one by one. All of them are exciting, otherwise I wouldn't include them, but I do have my favorites. Let's start with the one that to me personally is least exciting and then slowly work our way to the most exciting one. So for those of you new here, this is evolution simulation game The Sapling, my solo indie game project. It's a game where you can basically do two types of things. On the one hand, there are a number of scenarios tasking you to design an ecosystem that meets specific requirements. On the other, there is a sandbox where you can build your own algae, plants and animals, turn on random mutations and see how they evolve. Starting with number 6, Bark. This one is pretty straightforward. A very limited number of mouths will still be able to eat from a plant even if it has bark. Only two, in fact, this existing one with tusks and this one. Another food source you can get from plants with bark is number five, sap. Sap can be eaten, or should I say drunk, by this existing beak, but also by this beak and this mouth from the arthropod category. Sap as a food source has two important advantages. It does not matter whether there's bark and it does little damage to the plant, so they can continue reproducing. The main downside is that it only works for plants that are much larger than the animal. Number 4 is old meat. So where before a dead animal turned into meat and then disappeared, it now turns into old meat first, which has a different color. In real life, nearly all predators also scavenge to an extent and in the sapling this will be no different. Nearly all mouths that can eat fresh meat can also eat old meat. The downside, for most mouths, is that they get very little energy out of it. Instincts along the line of, if you see food go towards it, which cause animals to reach their food quicker, will now be extra beneficial to these carnivores. But you see where this is going. Some mouths will take the other approach and specialize in it, like this existing one. It's a retcon I'm particularly happy with, because until now this mouth was really similar to this one in terms of stats. Now it finally has a distinct purpose. But there are also new scavenger mouths. The right one is inspired by hyenas, which is often the first animal people think of when they think of scavengers. But while doing research, I discovered this reputation is not entirely deserved. Apparently they kill 70% of the food themselves. An important reason why scavenging is so successful in a simulation is that it doesn't hurt the prey population. The carnivores focus on animals that are already dead, and so this way don't kill animals that did not reproduce yet. Another food source with this characteristic is blood. It requires that the prey animal is much larger than the predator and does a little damage to the prey, but apart from that doesn't have many downsides. There are three mouths that have blood as their main source of food. On the left you see an aquatic one inspired by lampreys. For blood sucking you don't need jaws, so I thought it would be cool to have this evolve directly from the jawless primitive mouth. I should add that this is a bit of artistic freedom, because if I'm not mistaken, real life lampreys did evolve from jawed fish. This middle one is inspired by the vampire bat. Fun fact, real life vampire bats don't actually suck blood. They just make a wound and then lap up the blood with their tongue. The right one finally is the one for the arthropod branch. This one in particular inspired a body part where blood drinkers can store liquid like mosquitoes and ticks can, which I really like because it's such a visual way to communicate an animal has eaten. I've styled this storage organ after insect abdomens, which was done relatively quickly. Coming up with a readable icon for it, on the other hand, was a different story because basically the only recognizable thing this body part has is its shape. In the end, I settled for a top-down view where you can see the rest of the body, but it is made transparent to signal that part is not relevant. Anyway, when I saw these storage organs really in the game for the first time, it immediately struck me how powerful it is to get more insight in what the animals are doing. I actually want this kind of feedback for all food. And while that might be a bit too unrealistic, I figured we could at least have it for the other two liquids, sap and nectar. 
Ok then, number 2. Every update there are some features on the wishlist that just don't make the cut because you sometimes have to draw a line and ship something. This is something that I really wanted to add but that didn't make it into the C and sandbox update. Filter feeders. It's not hard to come up with some filter feeder mouths. The big question here is, how does plankton work? When I think of plankton, I think of small animals, and this is partly true, but plankton apparently is an umbrella term for all organisms that don't propel themselves against a current. The subgroup of planktonic organisms that need to eat, for example animals, is called zooplankton. There is another subgroup, however, called phytoplankton, that work by photosynthesis. And a subgroup of these phytoplankton are algae. Microalgae to be precise. And you probably know where I'm going by now. Microalgae fit perfectly in the simulation of the sapling. In episode 3 of this season, you saw how I added an extra small special body size for grass, and we can do the same for algae. Initially, the idea of not simulating zooplankton felt like a dissatisfying makeshift solution to me. But the more that I think of it, the more that I'm starting to like it. You could think of designing the sapling as figuring out which parts of real life to ignore to make something else possible. And for filter feeders, it's this. In the sapling, filter feeders eat microalgae. And the fit. The fit is truly beautiful. Not only can they be a separate body shape, like grass is a body shape for plants, I also already implemented eating while moving for flying animals, so we can just extend that existing system to swimming animals. But my favorite of this all, microalgae color oceans. Finally we can get rid of the blue oceans and have oceans in all colors of the rainbow. Initially I just used a texture where each pixel cell on the ocean surface corresponded with one plankton particle system below it. My reasoning here was that the pixely look that this would give would nicely fit with what we already had for the terrain. But for some reason I felt it just looked ugly. So instead I added one layer of smoothing where each pixel is the average of the four pixels directly next to it. Which looks like this. Okay then, for the grand finale. Long time viewers know that the main reason the game has a growing player base these days, and probably the reason that you found about this channel as well, is because I started focusing on features that look pretty or cute. And what is cuter than a mother animal carrying her baby? So far, all animals in the sapling have had a very R strategy parenting style, where they abandon their offspring right after birth, and I want to add a bit of variety here. Therefore, animals will now be able to evolve nipples, and even udders, giving a free energy boost to any young that might be around. Programming wise, this marks an incredibly rare case where Yagni was actually false. For those of you unaware, Yagni, meaning you aren't gonna need it, is the programming principle that states that you should focus on building the software you need right now, and not complicate it with all kinds of things you think you might need in the future, because these predictions are rarely correct. And indeed I keep rediscovering this is true all the time. But nipples are an exception, because many years ago I thought one day I might add body parts below the animal, and I've always maintained that code, even though there were no body parts actually using it. And now that's paying off. Like I feared, putting a body part below the body is not a very smooth user experience, but as long as there's no lag in the way, it's better than I thought, so for now I'm leaving it like this. And now that parents can provide food to their young, it has become beneficial for both of them to stay close together, which brings us to carrying babies. You of course need hands for this, which is another advantage game design wise, because hands didn't have much use yet apart from climbing. From now on though, having hands basically guarantees that children will be safe and well fed until adulthood. I had expected it would take me quite some time to get carrying babies to look right, but to my surprise early experiments showed that rotating a young animal and putting it below the parent already looked acceptable. As a speculative evolution twist, I'm even allowing this behavior for aquatic animals. I'm not so sure it would also work for air breathing aquatic animals, because I think the child would drown if it was underwater for that long, but okay. Let's assume these young also somehow get oxygen when their mothers get up for air. Okay, so bark, sap, old meat, blood, plankton and milk. 
Well, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see what will emerge in upcoming simulations.